Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us. Just a little uh, reminder, we're keeping our uh, videos and uh, audios muted for right now. I'm gonna, uh, we'll have our talk with uh, Richie and then at, at the end, the last uh, 15 minutes or so, we'll open up uh, for questions. Uh, we'll open up your, you can open up your video and your microphone and you can ask uh, questions directly to Richie. Uh, so if you'd like, uh, send all your questions to Color Cars and uh, they will forward them on to us. And then we'll, uh, um, as time allows, get to as many questions as we can. So Richie, thank you so much yes. for joining us. Uh, we're so excited oh, to have you here. And I guess just to uh, jump right into it, uh, one thing we'd like to kind of talk about, and you have a great uh, perspective about this, is writing for and creating for uh, the South Asian diaspora, not just specifically for India, but thinking of it in terms of an international audience and just the fact that, you know, South Asians are everywhere and kind of up to you. What would you like to, how would you like to jump into that? Uh, I mean, again, it's, it's, a, it's a general topic, I suppose. Um, and so I guess the thing is, um, I don't necessarily uh, I, I, the first the first audience member I think of, and this is a cliche, and we've all heard it before is is me, uh, as in what would I find interesting dramatically, um, and then as I start working on things, if they have a cultural context, like the last project I did had a, I mean the last couple of projects I did, I've done have had a cultural context, then I start to think about where I sit on that scale, and it I happen to be diaspora, so. I just think, well, how would I think about this? How would I feel about it? Um, that's, that's the first point uh, in terms of an audience cultural context that I think about. Then if it's something that takes place in India and has Indian characters and, um, and is trying to depict an aspect of India um, with a certain degree of verisimilitude, um, then, I, then the second point for me is I have to make sure that that the diaspora-ness of what I'm trying to do doesn't interfere with the realism of the environment I'm trying to depict. So I can't let um, I, I can't let an Indian in India look at the piece and say this is not real. This is not a realistic depiction. Oh this was this was done by somebody from the outside. Um, so those two things go hand in hand so that both sides of the the, the South Asian equation um, can get past all that and, and then take it in dramatically for what it is. Very cool. Do you ever get pressures, outside pressures from, for example, Netflix to make something and just because I've heard these horrible notes too, like more Indian or less Indian? Uh, it's hard for me to say because uh, in the, the last project I did, which, ha which ended up on Netflix, was done independently and then they acquired it. Uh, so it was done at that point. So there was no notes about, oh, do this or do that. They picked it up and then in six weeks it was on the air because it was completed. Um, so I've never actually gone through the note process with uh, that particular platform. Um, but the discussions I've had with them um, are uh, very much geared towards what is the market of the, the program or the piece, which generally has to do with language, with few exceptions. Um, the exceptions I found are in the U.S. domestic market. They'll make the exception for Spanish language, and that's it. the only exception that I found in the world for this. Is if it's going to be in Czech, then it's for the Czech Republic. If it's going to be in Russian, then it's for Russia. If it's going to be in Hindi. It's going to be in um, India, and then all the other markets are considered secondary markets. So that brings up an interesting point because I, I saw um, that. You you write in English and you have a translator translate more scripts into Hindi. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk a little bit about that process of working with a translator to kind of ensure one, the language kind of is authentic on one side, but you're not losing what you wanted to say on the other. Yeah, that requires a lot of quality checking actually. Um, and I've been lucky to work with amazing translators, um, different on each project. Um, but usually, I mean, I often, very much write in English. And then it's the language that I have the, the strongest command over of all the languages I speak, which is probably 2.1 languages. And, um, and then I'll get a translator to come and try and do as faithful a translation as possible. Now, keeping in mind that the, my experience is historically in India, the translation system is um, you have the story by, and then you have the dialogues by. Those are, those are credits given in India. 
which is not the same system as in kind of the Western environment. Um, so in my mind, it's, I'm not separating it. There's a screenplay as we know, as a lot of us know, and the screenplay includes all the dialogue and every screen direction. Um, so the translator will come in in an Indian context and you usually take an outline, which is given to them and then create all the dialogue around it. And that dialogue can be, that outline can be, guy walks into a room, says hello to his wife, and then the translator, or the, sorry, the dialogue writer writes, and it's like five paragraphs of flowery hello. And that's the tradition they come from. And in my situation is, no, my line, is, I've written the dialogue. It is three lines long. The translation should be approximately three lines long, like maybe two and a half to four to three and a half max. That's the, the variation. Script of the, uh, the, the length of the script shouldn't change. Um, and what I've done is basically the screenplay I have written is going to be the exact subtitle that is read, exactly. So the Hindi has to work backwards from that because I'm not just making this up. In the case of, of Delhi crime, everything I wrote was very precise in terms of police language and what was said in those environments. And then I kind of put it out in English. And then the reverse translation, I can quality check and go through everything. Now, granted, the translators do amazing work, but to make sure it's exactly what I need to be, I have to double check every word. So speaking of <coughs> Delhi crime, you like reverse engineering your Hindi to your English. Mm -hmm. uh, how is that reverse engineering the case files to a script? Uh, that's something I kind of did. I just did it on Delhi crime just to figure it out. And now it's something I'm doing quite often since then, because I've been writing other things in a similar manner. Um, and basically what I did was have, it wasn't that, that somebody hands you one file and the entire narrative is, is there. Right? You have to, you know, I had to gather it. There was, a, there were a few files which had a lot of thought in it. And then as I read those and started to construct the, the basic skeleton of the story, um, then I would go back and meet cops and, and get more information on various moments. I, I knew early on I wanted that story to take place over six days. And so I just labeled each day, not knowing how long, I, I mean, it was originally supposed to be a film. And then it just get, kept getting longer and then it became episodes. And then a couple of episodes were too long, so it just expanded because I thought, okay, a day per episode. And then it just got bigger. But I would just basically write a timeline, a very detailed timeline of what happened from various per perspectives of the cops that I met. Um, and, and some people would give different perspectives on the same incident, and I would just chronologically write that. Now, that took months of meeting people, months of gathering notes, and then months of sorting it out to create that timeline. And that timeline is about 50 pages long. And then I'm able to expand that out and start to, to dramatize it in a way that makes sense. Are you an outliner or do you... Uh, oh, I'm an outliner. Right? I outline to my grave. My grave is going to be an outline. <laughs> yeah, I'm outlining right now. That's all I do. <laughs> uh, so taking a, a little step back, uh, I wanted to talk uh, of transitioning from a first feature to a second feature and from Amal to Siddharth and how... Uh, something I found interesting that I read about, uh, and please fill in and correct me, was you took a lot of the um, money that was made and profits from Amal and just rolled that into Siddharth. Oh, wow, so, somebody's been, you've been doing your research. <laughs> so, so I was curious if you could talk about uh, financing and going from your first to your second feature and how much that helps to basically reinvest into your own, into your own business. Sure. Um, now, keep in mind that uh, Amol's budget was about 1.2 million in 2006 when we shot it, uh, released it in 2007. And then Siddharth, that film was shot in 2011. So there was a four year period where there were no profits. Um, and those profits then came in, in 2011 to the tune of about, I don't know, Thirty or forty thousand dollars? It was nothing. Wow. We ended up shooting Siddharth for eighty thousand dollars production, um, and and so the profits came in, and then whatever savings I had and the two other producers had from other work we had been doing, we all put that into Siddharth to shoot it for eighty grand, and then we raised um, arts council funds in Canada. You have arts council funding um, to finish that. Um, so it wasn't that. It's, it's like if your first film is a million, 1.2 million, and your second film is a production budget of 80,000, final budget was about 200,000. Um, the reason that was, I was able to do that and keep the scale of the film the same is because on Amal, 
we had a way bigger crew and a lot of restrictions on how to spend the money because the money was coming from Canada and it had to be spent on Canadian crew and had, we had to bring people over and stuff. So as a result, we had a crew of about 80 people or something. And after I finished that, I mean, it was a great crew, but after I finished it, I realized I could have done, probably done the same thing with like 15 people. Um, and so with Siddharth, we had a production crew of 12 people, in fact. Um, and it was a, a fully working, operational, functional crew to make a theatrical feature film that went around the world. Um, it just happened to work for that story. Um, and for me, the, the idea of shooting on the streets in Delhi again, I, I just knew how to, I figured out how to do it in a very light manner, which made the minuscule profits on Amul um, transferable. What uh, do you learn from that, from shooting Amul at that budget, that you were able to work with your department so efficiently and not have it seem like there was that, that any drop off in production value? Uh, the key is um, making those 12 people into 22 or, you know, 35-ish. Like, you, you choose people who are multi-talented. Um, so the producer on the ground I was working with also happened to be a great sound person if we needed him as a backup, and he happened to also know elect electrical engineering so he could wire the environment. The DP was at the camera op and brought all of his stuff with him and he was a visual effects supervisor as well because he was a visual effects artist the first ad was an art director so she assisted the production designer i mean we, everyone is doubling up um to do everything they can and as a result you kind of have everything you need but the scale you have to hold some under i mean we didn't have any sets right everything was real um so that's one thing i learned on that type of production that you have to crew up in a manner where if the idea is like, if you're going into a submarine and you have a skeleton crew, can your skeleton crew run every aspect of that submarine? Um, so everyone has to be extremely specialized and obviously get along. Interesting. Who's, who do you generally like to bring on first in, in your uh, pre-production? In terms of production crew? Yeah, the departments or production crew. Who do you, who is your um, first like go to? It, it depends on scale, right? On a production like Siddharth, the production designer can come in last. On something like um, something I'm working on now, production designer has to be very early on because the the initial budgeting because there will be lots of sets in its period, and therefore they have to help with the budgeting of understanding how much we need to raise. Um, so it really depends on the scale. Um, definitely, the casting director is is in terms of after after you have a script and, and you started to get the resources and you're going to actual pre-production, then casting director should have been probably before pre-production. Um, uh, but production designer is usually um, right away and obviously DP to, to establish whether or not the scale that you're working at will work for the look. Interesting. Um, so one thing uh, I'd seen before too is in your work that uh, speaking of actors and casting director is this, uh, idea that they're not acting, right? Like it's it's a very naturalistic approach. And mm -hmm. I know uh, I read Friedkin and Fincher are two of your weird inspirations on uh, on Siddharth and they have very different approaches and yours is, I don't know if it's in between them or in the middle, but when you're casting, when you're looking for your actors, are you looking for people who are those people or are you looking for someone who can, you know, turn it on? Um. You know, it's, so you mentioned those two guys, for example, Friedkin and Venture, and there were huge influences on Delhi crime, huge. And if you look at a lot of the stuff William Friedkin's done, especially The French Connection, um, it has the appearance of being extremely raw and gritty, but it's, it's, if you really analyze what's happening, it's extremely set up um, and well thought out to have that, that, to have that um, appearance. Um, and, you know, Gene Hackman is not a cop on the streets. He's an amazing actor who plays a cop on the streets. Um, so I look for uh, really the best actors to play the roles. I find, find most of the time that um, the real people are, are, again, it's kind of a cliche, but unless you're going to do the Mike Lee style of, or the Ken Loach style of really, you know, working with them and bringing them into the rehearsal mode, but generally with the budgets we have, we don't have rehearsal time at all. Um, so I, I find working with really good actors is the, is the way to go. Uh, generally, you want in an environment like India, it's, it's, it's interesting because you can find actors who um, have come from the environments that you're trying to depict. Um, so, for example, in, in, uh, in Delhi Crime, you know, one of the characters, his name is Ram, he's a constable, who's the guy we start the whole thing with. 
Um, I've worked with him on every film I've done. And he's a theater actor from Delhi. He's an amazing guy. Um, but he, he knows constables. And he just knows what, what to do to, to bring the life um, into that role based on the people he knows and based on what's on the page. Um, and if he didn't know constables, he couldn't do that. And I know him. And w- when we did the audition, I knew he knew constables. I could see it. And then he told me later he did. Um, so that, that is, is crucial for me. But it's not about necessarily getting non-actors. It's just getting the right ones. And we have a, a number of actors, too, in our, in our group. And I'm sure that uh, one thing would be interesting is, what do you expect when an actor shows up on your, on your set from the actor? Ooh, I expect them to memorize their lines. Um, <laughs> basics, 101. And um, I expect them to be on time. Um, and those are my two big ones. And I know this sounds like I'm not asking for a lot, um, but that's really all I need because um, there's an amazing director, actually, to me, someone I like even more than those uh, in terms of some of the work that you mentioned earlier, uh, a director named Peter Weir, Australian director. Mm-hmm. And he once said something I found so interesting, which every actor should hear, uh, which is when you're casting for a film, it's like you're a private detective looking for someone's true identity. And everyone who comes into the room is an imposter claiming to be that person. And only one person is telling the truth. And you have to determine who's telling the truth. Hmm. Now, with that in mind, there are some amazing liars. Some people come into the room and they're so good. That, and it's like, wait a sec, this person is amazing, but I'm not quite sure this person's telling the truth. And obviously, this is just all alleg- it's just an allegory. But, but the idea that if the person fits the role, and, and now they're coming to set because we've made that determination that they fit the role. They just need to memorize the lines and show up and they'll, they'll know what to do. Do you do uh, table reads or pre-rehearsal a lot? Or I guess it... No, I, I, I used to dream of doing those because it was like the Sydney Lumet style of three to four weeks of rehearsal. I'm like, that would be amazing. And then you get into it and the schedules are such that you just don't, there's no time for it. And most of the actors... I mean, there's some, obviously, some of the leads you have to work with beforehand just to make sure all the questions are answered. But then when you get into it, actors just come and go. And it's, if you've done your work and they've done their work, it should be okay. I would love to do a piece where I get to rehearse. And there's one film I've written, which is um, two actors, not in a room, but basically two actors the entire time just talking, which obviously requires rehearsal. Um, But for the most part, um, I try and write scenes in a manner where uh, it's the least amount of dialogue required for that scene. And therefore, what needs to be rehearsed is the movement of the scene um, and the relationship they have with each other uh, in, in the environment that we're shooting in. That's, that's, to me, the key. And you don't get that until the day of. The blocking and the, the, yeah. the, the interaction with your set, basically. Yeah. I will say there was one incident on Delhi Crime, which was really funny. We would lose a lot of actors. This actually is completely antithetical to what I said earlier. Um, because our schedule kept changing every day, we didn't have a schedule and we kept losing locations every night. So I would just wake up in the morning. And when I woke up, there was a call sheet of what scenes we were doing that day. And I'd be like, okay, I guess we're doing this scene. And I would just plan it out. We were so behind and so just barely holding on. And um, so as a result, we would lose a lot of the day players, actors who were supposed to come for one scene. They're just like, sorry, you gave me no notice. I can't come. And we would just replace them with crew members. It was like, you know what? Assistant costume, you can do that. And the, the ADs in India, I mean, bless them, they would just send me like auditions. Like, look, we got our costume guy, or look, we got our, our spot boy, or look, we got this person. What do you think? They give me four or five options and be like, yeah, that's good. I can work with that. And, um, and then they would come on set, and usually it worked out. In one situation, we couldn't figure it out. And it, it was down to one of our costume assistants and the producer. I'm like, both of these people have the personality that we need for these this character. So we just, we just set the whole scene up and we were about to shoot and the lead actors were in it too. And we just had a hole in the scene of this one person who comes in, says four or five lines and then leaves. And I just put them both in costume and said, all right, we're ready to shoot the scene. Let's just bring the first person in, see how it goes. And then we'll bring the second person. So it was like an audition, but with everything perfect. Camera was exactly where it was going to be. All the other actors were there. And that was, to me, the, the purest audition I'd ever seen, where it's like, oh, we know. We know right away. Because I really feel for actors when they are acting in empty rooms or to cameras and stuff. 
Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, in Delhi Crime, so it's uh, the way you constructed it too. Is it is a seven hour movie, and it was uh, when you were making it, and it was entirely written by you, and you directed each episode. Had you thought of farming any of that out, or or collaborating with another? the director to take any of the pieces or was it such a just vision in your head that you knew this was what uh, it, it was, was going to be it was a very specific vision like i wrote the script on spec so there was no financing there was no producers and i'd written it out and by the time it was all done there was nothing in the producers um you know blessed them and they came on and took, took a risk on it um there was not no more writing to be done there was a few notes but that was, that was those were things i could adjust it was a 430 page script um, and then in terms of directing, we had the, the limited budget and the limited time we had with that budget dictated that I just do it all in one go, like a film. And it wasn't that I didn't, I mean, I wanted to do it all. That was the, that was the plan. Um, but it just, it just made sense for the economics of it as well. So it's interesting because it's, it was, it was a 62 day shoot yeah. for Daily Crime. So did you shoot it, um, uh, production-wise as a seven-hour feature or where yeah. did you so it was so you shot like episode seven next to what you needed next to episode one as any, any as given day we're shooting yeah. two or three episodes at any given time yeah yeah so really was like this mammoth so i think i have a script somewhere here it's it's like it's like this thick it's like a, it's literally like a bible and you're i mean yeah you're shooting back and forth episode one and episode the last scene of episode eight and the first scene of episode one and one day like those kinds of things absolutely mm -hmm. And how was that juggling that massive of a of jumps in time and jumps in in production? I guess that's where you're relying on your team. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm relying on the team. I know it in my head. The lead actors really knew it. They, you know, they they mapped everything out. Um, and also the DP, uh, Johan, our DP was amazing because he just he kept tra he also kept track of everything, which really really helped. Um, you know, I I had been living with it for so long, so I knew every aspect of it i knew what day like chronological screen day we were in at any given time um and our continuity person our script supervisor Karina, she was so good at like having for me having sat with it for years you're kind of in the moment and it's like wait a sec Karina, is like you know did is this person supposed to be did they just come from their house or did they come from the office for this moment and she's like oh, and she knew it inside out i mean it, it is a really interesting phenomenon when you work on something for so long and everyone else comes in and they memorize your work um, it, it's, it's flattering, strangely. Uh, so we have an interesting question that kind of ties in from uh, a deal, uh, is having, uh, shot two features, uh, and now, uh, I mean, uh, written two features and now written entire, uh, Delhi crime on spec. Uh, how do you find your motivation? Uh, how do you find your, um, uh, what do you say? How did you find, uh, yeah, what keeps you motivated to continue writing on spec versus having someone put up money beforehand? Well, first of all, uh, two features you mentioned, right? There was another feature, I did a science fiction film. Uh, oh I yeah, I'll follow you down. Yeah. yeah, I'll follow you down. Yes. Um, and then I had written two features before I did the first one, which are sh crap scripts. Um, <laughs> so, but, I, but, but they count as something in terms of volumes of, I mean, stuff that'll never get luckily made. Um, and then since then, I think I've probably written three or four script, feature scripts. Um, so, um, it, 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 I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to point to the fact that in terms of the amount of work that gets produced, um, you have to keep, you have to do way more than that. I, I mean, I, do, I do. um, and hopefully the stuff I've now writing will get produced at some point, but, um, the motivation to me comes from life experience. It's the same thing I would say for actors as well. Like the actors in India that I've worked with, um, who have certain life experiences. If I don't have life experiences, I'm not. Uh, I don't know what I can draw from because I'm not as interested in drawing from, um, I mean, there's amazing books and literature and all that stuff, but that stuff doesn't get me going because if I don't do it, somebody else will. And I'm trying to now make a contribution um, in, in this sphere uh, of projects that if I don't do it, they won't exist. Um, and, and, and to me, it also has to contribute something positive. So the real motivation comes from is there a problem in the world, which we all know the answer to, uh, there are more, there's more than one. Um, so pick a battle and uh, go after it. Yeah, one thing uh, I, I read about too is um, for a lot of writers, myself included, and a lot of the people in our, in our group is we write uh, something that we can't not write. 
And if it's mm-hmm. an idea, and if it's an idea that you can get away with not writing, or you can turn your back on or turn away from, then you know it's it's you're never going to be able to spend the amount of time and resources that it's needed to see this through to the end. Yeah, um, exactly. It's an exactly it's an instinctive call of what what pulls you in that direction. The way I look at it is if I usually encounter something that bothers me so much and I can't make sense of it, um, and it's lingering that 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 pain or that sorrow or that confusion, um, then I will start writing something in order to 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 place that experience or that circumstance um, into a series of patterns. Um, it's almost mathematical. And when I understand what those patterns are then, then it becomes like, hey, you know what? I can share my pain with the rest of the world and maybe we can do something about it. Yeah. And uh, speaking of the world's problems, so with uh, a global pandemic going on, what have you, uh, something, Vishesh, another question that just came up, what have you kind of seen as precautions or barriers or, or what is the future looking like for an independent filmmaker post or in the middle of COVID? Die freeze. Uh, can't tell if my frozen or is... But I... There you go. You're back. Okay. Sorry. sorry. I guess it's frozen. Yeah. Okay. Um... The like I said, the operative word is independent because for filmmakers, there's never been more opportunity to do stuff. I mean, we can't shoot right now, but certainly we can develop. Um, it's one of the few industries that's getting such a boost right now a consum- in terms of media consumption. So I and I think it's just showing the pattern that's going to get more and more. People just want more stuff. So there's work. Um, independent, it's really hard to say. I think theatrical is, if not dead, then about to die. Um, if you can make for platforms, then great. If you're an independent and you're trying to get the attention of the world, film festivals are hurting right now, obviously. We all know that. But they're going to be back, and they're so crucial to curating independent filmmakers' work and then showing it to the world and then kind of giving filmmakers a platform to go make a living. Go into the mainstream world, and I'm not using mainstream as a bad word here. Um, go into the mainstream world and start to, to reach eyeballs. Um, I think the consumption is going so high that there is a lot of hope, but the traditional ways of making films uh, and, fi- and financing films is, is altering very quickly. What have you found in terms of the, that altering of the, the financing? Are, are you, what barriers have been added I mean, onto? Look, independent films always had barriers, I mean, especially more and more recently, but certainly series. I mean, if you have a series, people, there is somebody who's going to listen to your pitch. Um, if you have a film that works well for a platform and for a certain uh, demographic uh, that you understand or you're aiming for, um, and they require content, like South Asian content, people need, they need South Asian content, for exa- just for example, um, then there, there are people who will listen to you. I mean, there's, there's just not enough stuff right now to fill, to fill the empty spaces. So I think it's a, an amazing time, but it is, it's the plot, we know it's the, pl- the time of the platforms. And speaking of creating content, we have an interesting question from uh, Nargis uh, about Amal. And uh, she said, I see that your brother wrote the story, but had so much raw emotion to it. I wanted to know if this was a true story or did he just write it? Where, what was the genesis of Amal? The genesis of Amal was a short story my brother wrote, uh, which was based on an experience he had um, in Bangalore. He was, do- he was studying there. And he had had so many experiences with rickshawalas, which was, who were ripping him off and kind of acting in a really wretched way. Um, and then he met one guy who was so sweet and so kind, who didn't accept a tip, that the contrast of that moved him so much. And he had a, an amazing kind of encounter with this guy. And the more the guy refused to accept a tip, the more my brother wanted to give him. And then he wrote this short story, which was only three scenes long, but it was the backbone for a short film I made. Um, we uh, call him Amo. And um, that short film was essentially verbatim what Sean had written, um, uh, and which was essentially the setup to the character and uh, picking up this old man, r- driving him around, dropping him off, having an argument, and then a year passes and there's the last scene, the last scene of the film that you see where he's given this, this letter. Um, so it was, and it was very moving, I found. Um, and then I went to shoot it as a short film in Delhi, which was my first experience shooting something semi-professionally in India. And the experiences I had shooting that and spending time there in 2003 um, 
when I came back and I finished the shore, I, I, I felt that I experienced so many things um, similar to what my brother had to complement the, the amazing structure he had set out. And then we both wrote the screenplay together based on his experiences and mine in India separately and kind of mm. built up this story. So it was, it was a real collaboration, but he completely fabricated it out of an experience he had. And uh, on collaboration too, uh, Anumeha has a question that actually I'm very interested in as well as uh, visual language and the way um, technology has just been exploding and um, giving a director uh, an ability to use visual language in a way that has kind of never been available. Um, how do you collaborate with your DP on uh, Delhi Prime, Johan, uh, Johan, or any of your other DPs, and how has that changed over time with the advancements of technology and, and, and with the, the changes that you can get shots that were never before possible? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, getting shots that were never before possible in the world that I work in, you know, I, we're all dazzled, you know, when, I, when you see a movie like Gravity or something, where you're like, holy crap, I've never seen anything like this visually. That's a technological advancement. Um, the, the, the stuff I'm more interested in is, um, I mean, I feel that with all the technological advancements happening, the visual language has actually reached a critical mass where, um, very few things dazzle us anymore. Um, and if you look at all the big budget films, generally they're not very dazzling anymore. They're just, it's just stuff happening. I'm not even being critical. It's just a lot of images and movement and there's some impressive stuff, but nothing dazzling. Because we've seen it all. So I feel that the next um, frontier of creativity is um, screenwriting, which was the first frontier of creativity. And I still feel that it's, there's limitless exploration there. And so the answer to your question, my answer to your question is that if I've done enough work on the script and from a director standpoint, kind of looking, my, my final passes on the script are usually as much as I can block it. Um, and then I do another pass on the script after I've seen the location and then rewrite the scene based on the blogging so that everyone who can read it will be like, oh yeah, that table is there when they walk in the room and we know where the actor is going to be. And then I talk, I speak philosophically with the, the, the DP um, and the production designer and costume designer. Um, we get into the nuts and bolts later, but really it's like, well, what is, the, what is the emotion of this? What is the tone of it? What is the point of it? To me, everything should actually come back to the point of the entire project. Once we figure that out, um, I mean, with Delhi Crime, for example, one of the points of the project was to put viewers in, um, into an experience with the Delhi police because we, we all have a, a view on the police in India and I wanted to alter that view and therefore create, make the viewer a bystander. So the visual language was, where do we put the viewer in the room if they were just standing there watching this moment? Um, and that's where we would put Johan all the time because he was operating as well. Um, so it, it became what's the most efficient way for somebody to eavesdrop on this circumstance. And that comes back to the purpose of the project. Yeah, there's a, there's a, a lot of invisible visual language where it, it shouldn't take you out of the movie. Something like uh, just my own personal opinion on 1917. Uh, 1918, I forgot the name of the movie now, the, the long take. Yeah, uh, it's, to me, that took me out because I was, I knew I was watching a long 1918. I, I knew I was watching a, a long take versus um, other movies where, uh, like Zodiac, where you're, you're not taken out of, uh, you're not taken out of the story by even the, the, the camera tricks that, that yeah. Fincher does. And it depends on the, on the nature of your project. If you're doing a narrative film to following certain rules of narrative cinema or series, and that's one of the ways you want a viewer to not think that they're watching a movie. In certain other exercises, um, it's all about the visuals. Uh, and therefore, like, again, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not obsessed with gravity. It just, it just popped in my head. But gravity is an interesting, story, uh, interesting film because the story is so light. I mean, it's like a short story. It's like three pages of narrative that happened in that, you know, uh, hour and a half film. Uh, but it's all visual and it's, it's, it, there's never a moment where you don't think you're watching a film, but you're just like, wow, like this is just, it's, it's just a theme park ride. It's a different type of, it's, it's designed to be something different. Um, so it depends on your intention, I suppose. Uh, we have another interesting question about um, screenplays and writing uh, for spec and your thoughts on screenplay competitions. 
And is it better to pitch your work to production companies, to other directors, directly to actors, to talent? I guess this is coming from a screen, an exclusive screenwriter rather than a writer. Uh, yes, if they're, yeah, you're sending it um, to a director. Um, it, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a really hard racket. I mean, I've never just written and not directed something I've done. Um, so I, when I'm writing, I kind of know where it's going to go and, and how I'm going to pitch it and that the pitch is related to the finance. Um, I didn't properly answer your previous question, I just realized, about spec scripts, the motivation to keep writing spec, you would ask, which is related to this. I find that if you can somehow manage to get the resources to write spec, then you go out into the market with it, you will have control over the content because it is done. And then you can get people to sign on to it without altering it. Or if they want, if, if it gets altered, it gets altered in, in a limited manner, uh, but you agree on what those are. The more you have that, the better. Otherwise, you're just giving the, the, the skeleton to somebody else. In, in a screenwriter's um, instance who's not directing or producing, chances are they have no say over where it goes because somebody will want the option to change. Um, but if it's set, it's like, hey, you're buying the script. You can't change it. Um, except for kind of visual uh, extrapolation, uh, and that's that. Um, so in terms of actually, that's the answer to that one question. I find it's empowering to write spec. But to actually go out and pitch, I mean, it really depends. You know, um, if you have no connections to directors and teams, then you, do, you should go to production companies because they're the ones who do. They, they can package a project. Um, they come with their own baggage, depending on who it is. Uh, but I find like any other industry, um, all of this is based on trust. You have to figure out how to um, learn to trust people and they have to earn your trust. And once you get to that stage, then you take the leap. I, I've never worked with a producer. I didn't learn to trust in some men. Uh, all right, we are coming up on our Q&A. So let's jump into now our rapid fire section. Uh, so I'm just gonna, these are quick questions, just throw out whatever. Uh, sure. answer comes to your head first uh so first is what book would you recommend to filmmakers uh that's an interesting a question hey, wait is this a filmmaking book or just a any book anything a passage to india all right uh what film do you go back to for inspiration uh depends on the day and the circumstance but i'd say the film that inspires me the most overall is reds by warren Beatty. Uh, what is one thing you would tell your younger selves? Um, my younger self, I would say stop thinking about yourself so much. Um, and uh, if you weren't a filmmaker, what would you want to be? A diplomat. Diplomat, okay. Uh, and oh, sorry, what was the name of the book again? A Passage to India Passage by E.M. Forrester. Um, and then this is a, a little shout out to our uh, uh, Q&A for uh, Color Cars applications is if you, uh, what type of food would you be and why? Okay, what type of food would I be and why? That's an interesting one. Uh, oh, I, I think I'd be um, North Indian village food. Because I, I feel, I mean, I'm a veg vegetarian and I just feel it's, it's such a balanced diet. Um, the village food, the simple stuff. Uh, it's such a balanced diet. It's simple and it's always tasty and has a lot of variety and you can apply it in any circumstance. Good. Uh, all right. Now let's uh, open up some questions. Um, Nikhil uh, has a, a couple of questions that we could get. Nikhil, turn on your audio and video. Hey, folks. Hey, hey Nikhil. Mm -hmm. Hey, Richie. How's it going? Congrats on, uh, congrats on everything that's going on with you, man. Thank you. There's uh, the, the thought I have is in terms of script development being the key thing right now, I completely agree. Uh, but I'm wondering what kinds of um, boxes you think a uh, project idea needs to meet for you before you decide to pursue it. Uh, and I'm assuming that the number of ideas and the number of opportunities are much larger than the amount of time you have. Uh, so outside of the relevance uh, aspect and outside of the fact that it needs to have what you really want to uh, speak to, what else do you look for before you say, okay, I'm going to commit to this one? Uh, it actually, you've, you've hit it. It's relevance is the big one. What's the point of it now? And um, the other big one, there's three aspects. Relevance. Um, what can I, am I the person? Do I have a relationship to this? Um, 
idea or experience or circumstance or story or whatever that is. Um, and then the big one uh, after those is do I want to spend an actual percentage of my life on it? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mikhail. Uh, we've got another question from uh, Manu. So Manu, if you could uh, turn your video and audio on. Uh, and audio too, Manu. There you go. Zana? Okay, perfect. Hey, Manu. Hey, Richie, uh, thank you so much for this. Um, I'm sure a lot of actors in here have been asked the same question of like, why don't you go to Bollywood and try acting over there? Um, as someone who comes from like North America and is writing for over there, when you're doing the casting, you said that you want someone that has the lines memorized. Would accent be like a deal breaker in that if they're the most influential? Okay. No. Because because uh, accent is key in that environment. Remember, what I, kind of what yeah. I said in the earlier is that if I'm trying to make it so that an audience over there in India doesn't think twice about the realism of what I'm trying to show, they can't be thrown yeah. out of it by the accent of, okay. a, of an actor. Um, look, I, I look at, in terms of appropriateness, there's a lot of people on Earth. And, and so if you're talking about a colorblind role, there are lots of people... Not lots, but there are more, there's more than one per actor telling the truth out there that can fit that, that role. Mm -hmm. It would be a different version of that that performance. But there's more than one. In the same way, there's you know, it's it's. I don't necessarily believe in the one who loved me. I love my wife more than anything. But the idea that oh, there's just one person. I happen to bump into her at some point. It doesn't make sense to me mathematically. As you can see, I'm very logical. Um, and so there are, are multiple actors. For the appropriateness of certain roles, just question what they bring to it. Um, yeah. So, in an Indian context, one of the criterias for me is is like I'll never say, "Oh, there's this one person in the U.S. or one person in Canada I know is the most perfect person on earth for this." That doesn't exist in my mind. Yeah. I would look for the most appropriate person for that specific role. And if it was a police constable in Delhi, and there's a North American accent and they're Hindi, it doesn't make any sense to me. And yeah. I don't have time to deal with that right now. Now, if it's a superstar who comes in and, and finances the film, then you have to kind of figure that one out, right? If you're doing a project like The Passion of the Christ and it's in a, in a dead language and everyone's got to learn it, you got to figure that out. Um, I would okay. say from North American actors going into Bollywood or thinking about it or even contemplating it because there's a lot of interesting roles, is you have to also be willing to play the game of the struggling actor in Bombay, of which there are over a million right now who are paying rent, fighting with their landlords, going to court, dealing with cockroaches, dealing with cyclones, dealing with the pandemic, with no viable way to go to a hospital. If you're willing to do those things and get an accent coach, then go for it. If not, yeah, yeah. if you just want to work on your craft, then you stay. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and next, Priya M. Priya M has got an interesting question about... Uh, Delhi crime. Um, hi, Richie. Hi, Priya. Thanks. Um, I was curious, and I think you kind of answered my question in the previous answer. I was going to ask if Delhi crime was intended for the audience, which it sounds like it, it was. And then you kind of talked about how language dictated the primary market uh, a little earlier. Um, so I was wondering in the scope of, in the in that world, is there any scope for multilingual movies uh, that are cross-cultural and that could be relevant to North American audiences and Indian audiences? And if so, how would you go about pitching something like that? Like, would you try and find investors in the US or in India? Like, how would that work? Um, I can't necessarily speak to the second one because... Um, again, you're, you're, you're asking in a general sense, and I, and I kind of look at each project very specifically mm -hmm. as to what is the project. If I've conceived of it and written it, then it's probably taken me years to do that. And in so doing, I've contemplated various aspects of what market it fits into and why and how to pitch it and what language and all that stuff. It's very particular to that project. So from a general sense, I can't really answer that question because I can't think of all the the uh, criteria you meet for a project that doesn't exist, if that makes any sense. Um, you know, I, I, 
there are projects that come out in India that are in the English language. Um, platforms for the first time are making it possible for it to get out. Do they get seen? I don't know. Um, you know, do they find their, their way? Maybe, I'm not sure. Um, generally, I just try to be as realistic as I can to certain environments. And Delhi Crime was absolutely made for a global audience. It wasn't for me made for Indian first or this, that. It was literally, I looked at the entire world because I looked at it as a national story. So in the same way, if you're going to make a movie about a nine, about 9-11, to me, it's not necessarily just a, a movie for Americans because 9-11 is, a, is representative of something much bigger. Um, and with this particular incident, it, was a, it literally was a national incident where everyone I know, including myself, was never the same afterwards. We looked at the world a different way afterwards. So I looked at it as a national story, something emblematic of a representation of India, but also within India, as Indians would have, all Indians would have a very personal relationship to it. Yeah, I, I cried through the first episode. So, yeah, I guess thank you for that. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say, but thank you for watching it. It was very powerful. It was very powerful. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Mahira K. Mahira K, you can turn your video and audio on. Hi, Richie. Uh, thanks Hi. so much for your service to the community and for taking time out of your day to be present today. Um, this, you might have already answered this, but I guess what I, I'm wondering if you had any like anything to offer or anything to say to someone who's just starting out writing. Anything um, from your experience? Thank you. Who's just starting off writing? Um, well, where are you, Mahira? What country? You don't tell me what, what you're at. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm in the United States currently. Okay. So um, there's, there's, two, there's two ways I would look at it. One is there are career writers who write on contract for commissions who are just waiting around for someone to call them. And when somebody calls them, gives them an assignment, they're going to write what they can to make a living and pay the rent. Then there's the other side of it, which is the writer as... Cam said earlier, it's like, I just can't contain myself. I've got to figure out a way to get this on paper and I'm just going to write it and then to hell with it, let's see what happens after. That second one is what I started off as. And um, the, the, the holy grail of, of the filmmaking world in my, and writing world is making a living. That's the, the ultimate. You can, anything beyond that, anything, awards and all that, stuff and all that crap it doesn't even matter because if you're making a living you're, that is you've already reached the pinnacle in my view whatever that looks like and so in my situation i'm very lucky because right now for the moment i'm making a living on this and with that in mind i have still not switched over to hey i'll do this for hire or hey, i'll do this just to pay the rent i've still stayed with that original um choice i made which was i'm going to continue to write because if i don't i'll burst I, it's the only way I can understand the world when I put it into patterns. And for me, it's the patterns of narrative cinema and or now series, which to me is long form cinema. So um, my advice is to follow your urges. And, um, I, and that's not in a, I'm not saying that in a crass sense. Uh, and, and then, and this is very, very important, is figuring out what time of day you are creatively optimal. Um, everyone has a different time of day, and mine used to be different. Now I know for me, it's as soon as I get up. Within 10 minutes, I'm writing. Every day, as soon as I get up. The first half of the day, I have to. I, then my brain starts to get tired in the second half of the day. Um, so even when, when, I, when we were talking about doing this with Cam and Bashish, I was like, I can do it in the second half of the day, because first half, I must write. I must, must, must write. So finding that time, and then, and then the way I look at it is it's the best contribution I can make to getting my voice out there. You won't find me posting a lot of things on social media because that's not my version of communicating what's on my mind and what's in my heart. The way I do that is through the writing of, it, of the film. And if you're finding that that's how you want to do it, then I would figure out the way to optimally put it on, on paper and then business comes later. Thank you so much. Uh, we have an interesting... Um writing question from Monica Sharma. So Monica, if you want to turn your video and audio on. Hey guys, what's up? Hi, Hi Monica. Hi. Um, so I'm primarily an actor. 
I moved to the United States when I was 18 years old. So I feel like the arc of life that I've seen is very different. Growing up in a country, the reason I left India because I did not feel comfortable living there. I did not want to raise children there. That's why I moved. Mm-hmm. And you know, there are not a lot of scenarios that I have. Like I have a big picture, but I struggle with breaking it down. Dialogue is something that I struggle with. How can I, how can I make sense of things that I have a bigger picture? How, how can I concise them in a way that they make sense? Are you talking about this generally? Yes. Um, I, I, sadly, I need you to be a little more specific because it's a, it's a very, uh, I think you're actually saying a very specific thing. So, you know, like I have certain things that I want to say, talk about life of a girl. Like I've mm-hmm. always felt like I'm a displaced, you know, I, I call what I write diaries of a displaced girl. So I've, you're always, trying- I've always felt displaced. I felt like I've never belonged anywhere. Not back home, not here. I Got have it. family here. So, so you're, what you're trying to say is how do you get from here to a dialogue based script? Yes. 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 Okay. So when I first started off, um, I didn't take a screenwriting. I took a screenwriting class much later. Um, when I first started writing short films, uh, which was the late 90s, um, I didn't know either how people would write dialogue and how it, it was real and how it was relevant, how you come up with the ideas of certain scenes and stuff. So I started writing circumstances and, and um, situations. That's why I, I stick to outline. Outlines are so important to me. They're just paragraph breakdowns of every scene, and they, become very, they can become very detailed. But the outline, the paragraph of the scene, in my, the way I work, is, breaks down the function of the scene. So for example, a woman walks into a room and um, she yells at the guy for being such an ass the night before. He asks her, what are you talking about? She says, didn't you notice what you said when I said this, 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 this? I'm just paraphrasing what the scene is to you, Monica. But that paraphrase is how I've written it in my paragraph. And once I have that paragraph and it's set in stone and I understand it, it's not difficult to write it out into dialogue where you just start to hear it in your head because you've already already written the skeleton for an argument there. So it's it's very functional. But the the outline to me is crucial to get to that last stage. The dialogue stage is the easiest thing at the end once you've got that, in my view. I know other people who write straight to dialogue and I don't know how they do it. Me neither. (laughs) Cool. Makes sense. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, do we have time for one more question, Richie? Mm. Sure, um, we can do two more if you want. Okay, uh, so we've got an interesting one from Rohini. Rohini, if you'd like to uh, put your video and mic on. Hi, Richie. Thanks for doing this. Hi. Um, I had a question that you mentioned that you bring your production designers on quite early, especially if you have multiple sets. I was very curious about your collaboration as a writer-director with the production designers and bringing to work, like the world you're creating in the most authentic way possible. And also, um, since you often rewrite scenes post looking at locations, how does that, does that ever impact the visual tone of your film? Uh, it absolutely does impact the visual tone because it depends on the environment. I mean, I, again, I write, if I've written a scene where somebody needs to be, I, I'll give you an example. Uh, if you've seen Delhi Crime, so the first mm-hmm. episode of Delhi Crime, there's a shootout between mm-hmm. cops and this guy in his hold up in his house, um, right. who's basically a, a convict slash arms dealer. And they go into his house and get into this little shootout. Now, I had written it, and it was all based on something that actually happened, but I'd written it that it took place in a very specific type of colony in Delhi, and it took place in a house with stairs so that the cops Mm -hmm. could be at the bottom and he's shooting from the top. Um, And it was a very specific type of environment where they come in and they they can hear each other so they can talk and there would be an echo when they speak where he's somewhere up there and they're down here. Now that location doesn't exist because the, the, the specific type of colony I was looking for and the specific interior, which is redone the way this arms dealer has done it, doesn't exist. Obviously, they're two different places stitched together. Once I saw them, I was able to then just finish the tweaks on that scene to make it so that the actors know exactly. It's, it's all about geography to me, just simplifying the, mm-hmm. the geography so it makes sense. 
in terms of the conversations I have with the production designer and all the other designers and, co and costumes, so, I mean, again, it, it does happen early on. Um, but as I said, everything is about, is about the, the initial philosophy of the project. Um, that is, is the most important thing to me. Because I keep trying to keep in mind, why does this thing exist? Why am I drawing resources from the earth that are needed for other things to say the thing I want to say? As Cam said a while ago in one of his, um, his uh, lightning questions, I would have said to myself as a kid, you know, stop thinking about yourself. And what I'm trying to do, films are a very wasteful industry. And I think right now we really need to think about what we're drawing as individuals. I'm not trying to make this a, a, a you know, a, a lecture, but I'm trying to think of it in terms of if I'm going to say something with the project and something that I really believe in, then I'll go and get the resources for it. And every decision I make is going to, to go back to that raison d'etre, I would say, I would say, right. including design. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Uh, and we have one last question from uh, Namisha. I know there's a lot of questions we won't be able to get to, but uh, uh, Namisha's got an interesting one to I think, end our talk with. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Richie, uh, thank you so much for saying that there's such an appetite for South Asian content. I think everyone on this call is happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about... Um, I love this idea of, uh, you know, the sort of writer who's sort of bursting with something to say. So I've been writing prose for quite a time and I've moved a bit into screenwriting. Um, but I'm curious to hear like advice you have for someone who's uh, been writing prose and is starting into screenwriting, you know, um, a little bit more say about the patterns in narrative cinema that you talked about. Uh, sort of what that means and how to apply that to switching from uh, story writing to film writing. So you're exempt from my passage to India um, uh, request earlier because the reason I suggested that because I think it's amongst the, the novels I've ever read the best, the most interesting and beautiful prose ever. Yep. And the, and the plot is very simple. So it makes a very simple plot focused film. But the challenges in adapting something, something like that are the pro, is the prose, because the prose is the reason that piece exists. The way I look at screenplays, is, as, as any um, kind of career screenwriter can tell you, is that it's a, blue, it's a blueprint. You're writing a blueprint. I tend not to write prose in the screenplay unless you're trying to get a financier to get excited about it. But when I have a shooting script, it's, it's very, very dull because it's just this happens and this happens. And this happens. I just write what the audience will see and hear. That's it. I don't write anything else. You, I never write what, an, what, what a character feels, which is the opposite of prose. I never write what a character mm -hmm. thinks. I just write what they are doing and what they are seeing and hearing. And that's it. Um, and if there's a specific shot where there's no character in it, then I'll just write. You know, the shot is of this. I d tend not to do that too much until I'm doing my director's pass on it and just keep it simple. Um, but that's the, that's the key, to, but that's the big difference. There are so many rules in narrative cinema because cinema is narrative focused. We're talking about narrative cinema. We're not talking about mm -hmm. esoteric art house stuff or stuff that goes into art galleries and things like that. We're talking about narrative cinema, which means as plot, generally people think of it as plot first. With series that is now changing, in my view, uh, that has changed in fact, where it, there is a, a more of a, um, uh, a focus on um, expanding the narrative to include characters that don't necessarily advance the plot because the series can do that and you stick in the world. But with cinema, if you're talking about screenwriting, where it's plot first, that is the antithesis of what prose represents, which is feeling, emotion, and language. So if you're going to jump to the screen screenwriting world, you're basically stripping away everything you know about prose, going to write a schematic for simply what happens, keeping in mind that the whole gestalt of the thing should be prosaic. The final sum of what this all represents should be beautiful and poetic. But what is actually happening nuts and bolts in each scene is, is like data. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much. 
I know we should have time. So let's Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, one quick follow up to that, Richie, is um, of the scripts you've read uh, that are available, I guess, for uh, public to for us to read. What would you say is a is a prosaic or a fun or beautiful script that you've read? I don't. You know what? I couldn't tell you. I haven't read a script in over a decade. Over a decade, sure. like in terms of popular scripts, I've read the yeah. scripts that are sent to me. But in terms of popular scripts, I tend not to, because I look at because the direct, look. Uh, take this as an example, and this is a South Asian example, which I always look at because I'm so fascinated by this. And I know for a fact this is, this is roundabout what happened when Shaker Kapoor did Elizabeth. If you watch Elizabeth with Kate Blanchett, um, and I watched it many times, and I've discussed it with the team that made it, I don't think there was much of a script for that film. Because if you look at each scene, it, it's, it's like what we were just talking about. Each scene is like prose. It's so visual and so beautiful. And there's no way somebody just sat down and wrote what that was. It was a combination of a very detailed outline, in my view, and somebody who directed the hell out of it. Like Malik. And, and so I look at that as a, a very interesting combination of the final product. Now, it's, it's, it's to me, the more, in, the, the, the more valuable exercise is... is from the final product, ripping back what the pieces were based on the final product, not based on reading the script or analyzing the sound tapes or all that kind of stuff. I look at the whole, I, I just really analyze the hell out of the final, final product. Because from a directing standpoint, you never know who brings what to the table. Um, and I generally have been writing for myself. So to me, writing directing is merged. I don't generally look at... Um, I haven't a long time ago, but I generally don't, don't look at, at popular scripts. And I don't think we need to. There, you find your own voice. Uh, you know, okay. It's far more Great. interesting. Thank you so much. You know, we went a, a little over, so thank you so much, Richie, no for uh, getting your time. Uh, this was fantastic. Uh, Deal's going to take over the screen for just a second to show everyone. Uh, to sign up for our next uh, in the talk series, which will be Rami and uh, Shirian. Uh, Deal, can you share your screen? Uh, that one's coming up soon. So right after this talk, we will email everyone and uh, send them a link to sign up for the next part of our series, Rami Yusuf and Shirian Dab. It's, uh, sorry, I got the last name wrong. Mm -hmm. um, they will uh, be talking Wednesday. So this is a very quick turnaround uh, because of everyone's schedule that we try and accommodate. So this Wednesday, it will be coming up. So please sign up for the next in our Meet the Color Cars talk. And again, a big thank you to Richie. Uh, Richie, we've had a lot of people to say, uh, to ask me to say thank you again for your work on Delhi Crime and how much oh, it meant no. to them and how much it, uh, it helped them through uh, points of their life, uh, that it was very meaningful and uh, helpful for them to see that uh, representation on screen and to give hope that uh, there are actually good cops out there too. Yeah, what a time. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we'll see everyone soon. Everyone keep safe and keep safe. Yeah. Thank you.